What can Game of Thrones teach us about good game design? Quick warning before we get started, we'll be spoiling all of the seasons of the HBO show, so make sure you're caught up or proceed at your own risk. Aside from pillow talk and bloody deaths, game talk is one of the primary features of the Game of Thrones universe. I mean, it's pretty obvious from the title, right? It makes up most of Littlefinger's conversations with Sansa in recent seasons and some of Cersei's best lines. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win. You die. And we certainly know how to determine a player from a pawn in the Game of Thrones. Generally, players are the ones twirling their mustaches and scheming, while pawns are, well, meeting the fatal embrace of the many-faced god. We know what the win state is too, and we've definitely seen what a fail state looks like. But can the rules of this fiction really be considered proper game design, or is George R. R. Martin just making an extended metaphor? Well, let's start with one of the pillars of game making, level design. Environments define the nature of any game, and good level design both sets the narrative tone and determines the logistical parameters of play. And on this front, Game of Thrones excels. Both the show and the books emphasize the world map in a way that defines both the fiction and the balance of power. Like a camera panning over a video game level, the iconic opening credits establish just how important the physical layout of the world is to mastering the game. Of Thrones. The remote areas of the north, for example, are known for their wildness. The population is too big and scattered to be tamed. So throughout history, the Wardens of the North, aka the Starks, have had great bargaining power as their trusted rulers. Plus, there's only one major land border, leading to several easily defensible choke points. Meanwhile, the fertile lands in the Reach grant House Tyrell the majority of the resources. They're also historically the most skilled gardeners, making their family essential to the realm's survival, particularly with that long winter coming. So days grow shorter. The map not only establishes history and setting, but determines the dynamic between players too. It balances power through the delicate distribution of resources and tactical advantages and disadvantages. The Lannisters are rich, but they have two hard to defend land borders. The Greyjoys have a strong defensive position, but their rebellion was easily crushed by a stronger navy with superior resources. I mean, just imagine if the capital of Westeros was in Winterfell or the Eyrie instead of King's Landing. Those are two practically impregnable locations for southern armies, so you could kiss the entire Game of Thrones goodbye because no one would have a chance in hell of taking the throne by force except maybe the Targaryens and their dragons, which I'll get to in a minute. You can see how well balanced the map is by analyzing Stannis' two different methods in trying to take back the Iron Throne. First, he tried directly attacking the capital. Blackwater Bay gives King's Landing both the advantage of accessibility and trade and the disadvantage of being conquerable by a strong navy. But in the end, Tyrion outsmarted his rivals with a secret weapon, and Stannis realized he'd have to win over the realm before he could conquer it and eventually rule the population. So he then decides to start in the north, because, hey, the Lannisters aren't too popular up there lately, and there's enough unrest to possibly breed a rebellion. And while we're on the subject of knowledge as power, controlling the flow of information is also crucial to game design. Designers call it situational awareness, and it's integral to balancing the game's difficulty and determining player behavior. In a first-person shooter or strategy game like StarCraft, you'll recognize situational awareness as the tools you're given to root out and destroy your enemy. In StarCraft, situational awareness is why you send out a probe in the early game if you're Protoss to scout your Zerg opponent. In an FPS, you're given situational awareness through your HUD map or the line of sight on your gun. The idea is that the more intel you have on your opponent, the easier it is to annihilate them. Always keep your foes confused, Littlefinger tells Sansa in Season 4. If they don't know who you are or what you want, they can't know what you plan to do next. Situational awareness is even more important to Game of Thrones than StarCraft or first-person shooter because you have to determine who is a player and who is a pawn. You have to cloak your intentions in secrecy while simultaneously gathering all the information you can if you want to survive. Both Stannis and Bruce Bolton are trying to jockey their situational awareness against each other. As a northerner, Bruce knows the terrain way better, but as an experienced military commander, Stannis knows how to manipulate the Bolton's allies into fighting against him instead which leads us to Game of Thrones' main point of player interaction beyond the battles, alliance building. Much like in the board game Diplomacy, players of the Game of Thrones live and die by their ability to negotiate terms, gain and manipulate trust, and sniff out betrayals. The rules of the game don't just allow for backstabbing and cheating, it's literally the best strategy for maintaining power. Each house's special resources and advantages have a counter. So the Lannisters might have wealth and large armies, but the Starks have loyal subjects and more knowledge 
knowledge of the unknowns in the universe. The map is so balanced, no one can win the Iron Throne alone. Each player is both powerful and powerless at the same time. But there is one fatally overpowered weapon in the Game of Thrones fiction, and it almost destroyed the universe altogether. Dragons. When the Targaryens decided to conquer Westeros all those centuries ago, it was like they basically brought tanks to a sword fight. As with Counter-Strike Sniper Rifle, dragons turned the balance in the Targaryens' favor on a dime, and no one could do anything to stop them. No single house and no single alliance could match their power. So Westeros fell into the not always so stable hands of the Silver Hair Dynasty. But on the other hand, when you pull back from the warring houses, even the overpowered dragons have their own counter. This is a song of ice and fire, remember? So let's not forget about the King White Walker's ultimate, come at me bro, at the end of the Hard Home Massacre. The more we learn about the Game of Thrones world, the more it looks not just like a game, but a well-designed one at that. George R. R. Martin has done something incredible. By utilizing game design in his narrative, he's created a world with such clear rules that it can be translated into board games, short stories, books, and even video games near seamlessly. The board game is highly ranked in communities across the internet, especially in the strategy genre, which should not be surprising at all. And though the Telltale games have their own quirks, reviewers often point out how perfectly the fiction's premise fits with the engine's emphasis on narrative consequences. We have a lot to thank George R. R. Martin for, but I want to thank him for driving home the human experience of game design, because sometimes it can be hard to see how the abstractness of game making applies to our everyday life. But with Game of Thrones' superb level design, world building and play structure, we see the tenets of game design played out through the fates of our favorite characters. So what do you think? Is Game of Thrones a well-designed game? Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Total Biscuit, who apparently watches the show, hey there, takes issue with the assessment that Monopoly is a good game because it posits its anti-Monopoly message through bad game design. He thinks that a good game could present the same message while still being compelling. But part of the point is that it's a much different and better game when it's played among professional players who know the proper rules and strategy without bringing cultural baggage into play. The whole point of the episode was to show that if you go back to Lizzie Maggie's original intention, you have a fundamentally different game, even if the changes that people have made over the years sort of seem small. But I understand where you're coming from. There ostensibly could be a better game that might be designed to instill its philosophies on the players, and there are obviously good examples of that as well. Eric Eldridge mentions a fascinating version of the Landlord game called the Landlords and Prosperity game, made later in life by Maggie, where at any point players can vote to switch between two different sets of rules. One rule set made the rent be donated towards a social interests like education and raising wages, and the other just went back to the greedy land grab that we all know and love today. <laughs> this game is amazing. Travis Bewley brings up a great point that the game still maintains a socialist core, even with all the capitalist trappings that have been piled on top of it, since everyone starts on equal economic footing unlike in real life where there's baked in income inequality at birth, which is interesting because that means everyone who wins Monopoly is a self-made millionaire, not someone who inherited their wealth. Um, anyway, one of the interesting things about Monopoly is that it's played all over the world, and so people project their own cultural context on top of it, as you saw with the Quakers, for example. It'd be really interesting to see how uh, different cultural contexts affect the way that people play, but we didn't have time to get into it in the episode. The Internet Peasant gives a house rule fix for Monopoly where you can re-roll as many times as you want, but each re-roll costs more money than the last, which is a really interesting way to play. There's also a project called the Board Game Remix Kit that you might want to check out if you're into that kind of thing. Um, basically, you can spice up your Monopoly doldrums by this, uh, adding this additional rule set. I'll link to it in the description.